How's it going, everyone? Welcome back to the channel. Continuing on the series of interviewing artists, today I have Katie McCrimmon of Crimson Key. Say hi, Katie. Hi, everyone. Crimson Key has been producing music for 15 years uh, with a hiatus between projects. Uh, Crimson Key has releases dating back to 2019, including the most recent release of A Light That Escaped earlier this year. What are you up to, Katie? Honestly, I, I can't complain. Um, I finally had the chance and opportunity to focus on my solo music and uh, release it myself independently. Thank goodness for DistroKid because there's sure. a lot with social media that I'm still learning. I got you. Okay, so the first thing I wanted to kind of ask you is, you said you finally got a chance, and I kind of wanted to jump on that because in a pre-interview, I asked how long you've been producing music, and your answer was 15 years dating back to 2008. With the way that you know your releases, the earliest release for Crimson Key is 2019. So that math doesn't quite add up. Do you tell <laughs> well, us a I'll bit about... The gaps. <laughs> sure. Yeah, go ahead <laughs> so, and do that for us. Um, long story short, I've been playing piano since I was five years old. Um, okay. I started writing my own music when I was about uh, 13, 14 years old. And I uh, released a small little, you know, self-produced, self-released, you know, EP, small little eight song album in uh, about a junior, senior year of high school. Um, I always felt that I couldn't just go by, you know, my name as the stage name. So Back then, I used the name Nienna. I was big into Tolkien and Lord of the Rings and all that stuff. And Nienna is one of those characters. She's a, uh, the Lady of Sorrows. Basically, she uses music to help people. And that's kind of what I awesome. gravitated towards. It's what I wanted to do with music. So I used that as a stage name early high school years. Um, and then, of course, uh, high school, middle school, around that age, I discovered metal. I discovered, wow, oh my gosh, Iron Maiden, Children of Bodom, Dark Tranquility, <laughs> right. Dream Theater, all these amazing bands. And I was like, damn, I want to do that. And I am not very proficient with guitar. I'm not very proficient with drums, but I'm able to get by and write, you know, some solid alternative rock music. But when it comes to like the more complex death metal, heavy metal stuff, I, uh, I was lucky enough to join a band in 2000, uh, 2010, 2011. Uh, it was a local band in El Paso called Archetyped. And uh, we relocated to San Antonio, Austin area about 2012, 2013. We wanted to continue pursuing music there. That band, you know, I it didn't continue on the way I would have hoped it to, as I would have liked it to, but that's actually when I the vocalist for the convalescence. Um, I met Keith Wampler, archetyped open for the convalescence one time. And Keith said, hey, you're a really talented keyboardist. I would love to actually add keyboards in on our next album. So 2013, end of 2013, I joined the convalescence and recorded an album with them. And 2014, I started touring with a symphonic deathcore band so from 2014 to about 2021, I've been playing in, like I said, in a in a big symphonic death metal band, deathcore band, and that definitely sidetracked me from doing my solo stuff. I focused all of my energy into writing more complex music, more complex stuff that would go into you know a genre that doesn't normally have keyboards. So I definitely focus more of my energy on that. And um, and I quit the convalescence uh, last year. I finally had the chance to write my own music. And it's a complete 180 away from the, the metal, death metal that I've been playing. But it is going back to my roots. It's going back to the original thing that I had in mind when I first started writing my own music. Gotcha. It's like full circle. Yeah. So are you saying that uh, Nienna would be proud of what you're what you're working at now? I think so. My my younger version of myself, I think, would be very proud with everything that I've been able to accomplish, and uh, definitely it, just to persevere to continue on with you know doing something 
now at this point kind of out of my element, but still back to my roots. So sure. Well, the very obvious thing we could hit on after that is what sort of challenges have you faced with that 180, you know, touring with a death metal band for uh, years and then jumping back into something that's incredibly different? Well, definitely it's, it's been a challenge networking. Uh, I'm very, very appreciative that most metal heads that I've always run into and befriended and talked to, they're very open-minded about listening to different genres, different styles of music in general. So I can definitely still contact some of the old fans and friends that I made on you know, on the road. And they'll definitely enjoy and like the music. And past that, they're like, we don't really have any networking tips to give you because <laughs> all the promoters, all the booking agents, all the tour managers, all the people that I have known strictly to death metal. So it's a new it's a new frontier for me trying to basically go back to square one, meet new people on the internet, meet new people at, at shows locally, meet, you know, start making brand new connections. At sure. least I have the experience of touring and I've had the experience of, of what being in the industry is like, but now it's like, okay, gotta gotta make new friends. <laughs> Gotcha. So is there any carryover at all that you could take from, you know, years of uh, proficient and, you know, effective music, playing, touring, writing, etc.? Is there anything that carries over to your current project? I think the, the things that carry over to my current project are the things that when it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when I'd like to, you know, go back out on the road. I used to help book small tours um i used to you know help kind of like manage how things were going on the road and and, and definitely plan out a budget and uh kind of know what to expect being out on the road and knowing also that since it's a fresh new project right back at square one i need to be realistic with expectations and what mm-hmm. what to see out there when i when i do finally get back out there is mm-hmm. Crimson Key a solo project? Oh, okay. So that's the other thing. I I wrote the music to it. Um, gotcha. I wrote keyboards, the vocals, the, the lyrics, the guitar, the bass, drums. I did have some help with a few tracks. I had a friend, I reached out to him. Hey, I kind of looped some things together. Can you actually make it sound like a good drum track yeah so i i did write a uh, you know pretty much everything but i can't really call it a solo project because i have reached out to other musicians my my boyfriend jeff he played bass in the studio uh, our friend oliver and my other friend uh, pat brady who helped record um he played the guitar parts in the in the studio um same thing when it comes down to even even the album artwork i reached out to uh drew hicks online hey can you can you do some album art for me uh chad clark hey can you design a a logo for me hey tara can you design some merch designs so i feel like it's been a big collaborative effort amongst various artists on you know every different level and the touring situation, I would definitely have to have my keyboard set up to probably play backing drums and backing guitar. Um, my boyfriend, Jeff, would be playing bass live. And of course, I'd be playing keyboards and, and singing. So it'd be a, a relatively small and efficient setup if it's just the both of us. I mean, if I'm lucky to snag a drummer and guitarist, well, then that'd be even cooler. But realistically, that's what I'd have to accommodate and plan for. So Gotcha. Okay. Uh, Something like that, yeah. Okay, cool. So that's what touring looks like. And going back further, you mentioned the expectations and managing those sort of expectations. What are the kind of expectations for when you do move forward with what you're wanting to do? Well, it uh, it would be definitely going back to square one. I I know that it would be a very DIY thing. So I I mean I've played shows in front of twenty thousand people. I've played, you know, sold out, you know, really, really packed crowd kind of places. I'm going to have to now realistically say, hey, this is a new genre for me. I'm going to have to get my name back out there doing what I'm doing now. I have to realize that there's going to be probably some dead nights. There's going to be probably some some rough things happening on the road. So I can't expect, you know, I mean, even when I was touring, it was not 
I didn't have any expectations of, you know, a rock star red carpet rolled out for me. I just wanted at least the bare minimum so we can get to the next venue and at least just have a successful time and engage with the people that are present, that are there. Um, of course, make good connections and, and, and hopefully, you know, grow on that. That's going to be the main thing that I'd like to do. Very reasonable. Uh, so you yes. mentioned this is not a solo project or it doesn't feel like a solo project feels very collaborative, even though Crimson Key is just uh, Katie McCrimmon for all intents and purposes. Uh, you listed off a ton of people. Have you always had that attitude of collaboration, generosity? You seem like someone who's you know very appreciative of the circumstances that you're uh, a part of. Did, is that something you picked up along the way or is that just kind of uh, – who you are as a person? Um, I I think that's honestly how I've always been. I I, I really I, to be quite honest, I'd say after like last couple of years, I went through some some real uh, life changing circumstances, and I finally was able to harness a healthy self esteem. I finally can now right. you know say right. no to things that don't serve me. I can say no to things that don't feel right. I was definitely a people pleaser for many, many years, way longer than I should have. I finally feel that I have the the strength, the courage, and the confidence to say this is what is serving me well and this is not what's working for me and be able to stand up for that distinction. Um, so I guess why in the past and even even still now, I, I can't just be like, oh, yeah, it's all me. It's it's all me, 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 me. It, I I can't do it. I feel awkward still. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's understandable. And you hitting on some, you know, some uh, life experiences that you've been through in the past couple of years. One of the things I found is. Um, it's a quote from you. Uh, I'm in such a better place in my life now, but the past is still a part of me. And a question I wanted to ask based on that is, do you think this applies to music as well? Do some of the uh, experiences, maybe you write off of those kinds of traumatic experiences, do they stay with you? Do you have to kind of distance yourself from them? Uh, no, yeah. with, without a doubt. It's definitely, it's, it's helped inspire a lot of songs like off of uh, that EP I just released. If only you knew actually touches on that low self-esteem that I, mm -hmm. I had had for so long. It was, you know, being a pushover. Oh yeah, I'll do whatever you say. It's okay. And that got me in some really bad situations, really bad scenarios that I, I don't regret, but I should have known better. And a lot of people should have known to treat me better, too. I felt that I was definitely taken advantage of and manipulated and used. Um, and I, of course, was, oh, well, it's, it's not too bad. It's OK. And that's where that song comes from. And I'm able to really harness that that feeling and put it in a song and full circle. Hopefully someone else can relate to that, too, because I know out there a lot of people have struggled with self-esteem issues, have struggled with the people pleasing tendencies. And, you know, it's hopefully a, a something that they can say, like, hey, you know, I don't, I don't need to take this bullshit. Like, I can I can do something about it. That's great. How attached do you think we have to stay to our music? Because some could argue that, you know, this song existing, that particular song just in this in this uh just for this occasion, it, it's almost like reliving it in a sense. Does music just help you or does music just help you process to kind of keep your distance from reliving that? I think it helps process it a lot better. Um, it definitely, it causes me to sit down and try to lyrically come up with something tangible that is more of an emotion. Um, I feel like I can release more of an uh, more emotions through just playing but i also feel that words are powerful and being able to sit down and try to say hey this was a, a really bad situation this was a really rough time for me how can i put it in a lyrical format to make it flow and to kind of process my own thoughts to really put it together and it, you know yeah it does bring up old memories it does bring up you know old feelings but at the same time i can sit back and say hey 
it's out of my mind. It's released. It's, it's somewhere else. It's not just stewing in my brain. I already sat, I already processed it. It's a song. It's done. I don't have to keep thinking about it and ruminating over it. In a pre-interview, I asked, uh, I have musicians, you know, answer a pre-interview and you answered, how would you describe your music? And I wanted to ask you, what is trip pop? So I'm pretty sure you've heard like Porter's Head, Tricky, Massive Attack. Yeah. They're trip pop. So they have more of like Tricky. They kind of like do a little bit of like rapping here and there. Mm -hmm. uh, same thing like Massive Attack. They have a little bit of more of like a like a R&B rap type flow. So it's trip hop. Whereas mine, I rely on a simple standard for, you know, four, four, four chord song progression which is typically considered pop music. Mm -hmm. But with the type of beats that I'm able to put over the music with the very, you know, some similarities to Massive Attack, Porter said, I kind of just coined that trip hop, trip pop. <laughs> and I mean, I don't really see any other bands with that, that, uh, that label or even that genre. And I'd like to maybe, I don't know, pioneer something a little bit different, especially, you know, being a metalhead and then doing something totally opposite from what people would expect. I just kind of want to see where it organically takes off or see organically how it grows and, and gains attention. The pioneering of the genre, was that kind of natural or did you kind of intentionally want to hit something that hadn't been hit before? Honestly, I never really intended for it to be a pioneering thing. I just kind of had an idea in my head. I sat down at my keyboard or my computer and just started writing, just started writing music and writing what felt right to me. I quite frankly, I, I hate the whole, what genre is it? Because I, I pull inspiration from so many different locations. I, I, I always hated that. Even in metal, they're like, well, what are you? I'm like, a symphonic death pour. It's, I mean, at, at this point, it's just so muddled up. I mean, there's Irish folk black death metal, there's shoegaze, jazz, punk music now. I don't know. I mean, people just kind of like mix their together and just make it different or make a new genre because they have so many different things to put in one spot. <laughs> you've done what a lot of musicians haven't been able to do. You know, you've, uh, produced and recorded, you've toured uh, for a number of years successfully uh, with enough to pull from and fill a highlight reel. What are some of the underappreciated successes, you know, that are, mean a lot to you, but won't make that highlight reel? Honestly, I think the one thing that I'm, I feel very accomplished and very proud of was uh, I actually, aside from music, I'm also a nurse. Oh, wow. And I, uh, I was inspired. Bruce Dickinson, he, you know, he battled cancer. He, you know, makes his own beer. He's an airline pilot. He's, I mean, he's also have, has multiple doctorates. He's a very accomplished man. And I thought to myself, if he's able to do all of this, I can go back to school and get my bachelor's degree. Mm -hmm. I can do it. So between 2016 and 2018, I was able to enroll in a purely online college program to get my bachelor's degree. I was talking to my teachers and let them know, hey, I have another very out there career path. I, I play music, I'm on the road. Wi-Fi signal might not be great in some spots or you know, maybe some tour incidences, bus problems, you know, whatever it may be could occur. I would just stay in close touch with the teachers and they were completely accommodating to everything that I was doing. They actually gave me a lot of kudos and uh, in 2018, I, um, I graduated with honors with uh, my bachelor's in uh, science and nursing. And I did all of my classes pretty much while I was on tour. And a lot of the bands that knew I was doing classes, they definitely were very helpful and accommodating. Oh, you need the green room to study? Sure, go sit in that corner and, and, and study. Or, oh, hey, you need to go sit in a quiet space? Go sit on the tour bus. It's fine. So I, I feel very accomplished that I was able to pull off two different career goals at the same time. How? I don't know, but I did it. That's really awesome. Uh, congrats on that and uh, incredible. 
<laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so you worked with multiple musicians across different genres, you know, st- still currently working with a few of those musicians. Uh, what are some things that still surprise you about your musical journey, whether it be people you've worked with or uh, something that continues to happen or, you know, one-offs or that kind of thing? It's definitely, it's it's a journey. It's always a learning experience. There's a, a ton of good people out there in this world. And then there's some Uh, you know, with nefarious intent, you just always got to keep both eyes open and, you know, plan for the worst, but hope for the best. And it's just a matter of just, um, you know, keeping good, healthy relationships with, with people you're working with, you know, stay in touch with people, stay, you know, networked, stay, you know, in touch, you know, just make sure that you're supporting them and you can, you know, get the support in return as well. So I always try to Try to keep that mentality of just, you know, good, solid networking, old school, just communicating, I think, goes goes far. You had an EP release come out earlier this year. I uh, released The Light That Escaped. Uh, Like I said, I did that all independently um, Mm -hmm. through DistroKid and uh, just having the stuff up on YouTube, Spotify, um, iTunes, Amazon, basically DistroKid was able to help me reach all the social media outlets and kind of just cover all my bases there. Sure. Uh, it's It was one thing I was waiting around to see if maybe there was someone I knew who could help, you know, pick up that album for a small label, management, something. But at the same time, I'm like, I'm not going to wait around sure. for sure. something that may or may not happen. I have the capabilities now to do it myself, so I might I might as well do it, especially because um, that album or the the EP was actually lost. I uh, had time in 2020 to uh, record some music because I wasn't touring. I wasn't really, you know, doing what I had usually been doing. So I had time to sit down and really go back to my roots, rewrite some stuff and and work on my my solo music. And uh, my computer just died. It just stopped working. I thought I had them backed up. I did not. So that kind of put me in this spiraling downward depression of like, well, what's the point? Why why do it? I just lost everything. But I, I regained the confidence. I found some old files. I really dug deep and I found some old files and thought, well, I need to do this. I need to do this. And if anything, it's to prove to myself that I can and so releasing it was a, a very, very significant milestone for myself. I mean, it like like I said, I'm I'm realistic with my expectations. It's new. I, you know, I'm solely doing this, you know, pushing it myself with the help of, of my boyfriend and fans and friends who are sharing it through social media, you know, getting the merch, getting this, you know, the album digital like that. I um I just, I knew that I needed to do it regardless of the outcome, regardless of, of how many likes or how many views or how many, how many streams, I just needed to do it for myself. Losing uh, a fair bit of, you know, your album and stuff. Was there anything that you revisited or that you re-recorded that you actually ended up liking better than it originally came out in the corrupted files? Um, honestly, yes. Uh, exit sign. Um, that one is definitely my my big middle finger song to a lot of people that have wronged me in the past. And I, um, the original song had a very strange like violin solo over the intro, and it just sounded forced. Uh, thinking back on how I, I initially had it together, it it didn't seem to fit. I think that simplicity was the best way to go with that track to really just let the lyrics really just hit home because I that was the thing I wanted to stand out and uh, I think cutting a few things and going back to the drawing board actually made the EP a lot stronger I was actually able to incorporate songs that I didn't even think of putting in the first go around so it definitely I think it it worked out better it was really heartbreaking to lose the stuff that I worked hard on, but it was, it was meant to happen the way it did. So. (laughs) Cool. 
so if I have my timeline correct, the earliest of these releases is uh, 2019. You said that up until uh, 2021, you were with um, uh, you were with your touring band. How do those releases where those dates intersect? How do they differ from the most current release where you know you're entirely on your own? So the ones that I released in 2019, those are actually, um, I believe I backdated those. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> I, wrote, mm-hmm, I wrote the songs around that time, 2019, 2020. Um, and I just kind of, you know, put them out there, shared them, you know, sporadically just to kind of see what what feedback, what input I would, I would get at that point in time because I wasn't really able to um, independently – branch away from what the band was doing. I, uh, I was uh, basically in a position where the band was the be all end all. Everything had to go towards that project. Whereas if I tried doing anything else, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't looked upon too favorably. So I just sporadically did stuff to see what response I'd get. I have a band camp page and I just thought, Oh, what the heck? Why not see, you know, put a few songs up. And at that point it was just my name. Um, Crimson key actually came about as, as a good solo project because um, my hair is usually a dark red color. And one of my friends used to call me Katie Crimson because McCrimmon is not a common last name. So it was always mispronounced, misspelled, misstated. And Crimson was like, I was like, that's badass. That That's actually a really cool mispronunciation. I'll stick with that. And I just, I wanted a simple two word project name. Well, key, I, I collect antique keys. I play keyboards. It fit, it fit. I know there's a lot of bands with Crimson in it, but it it's personal to me. And that's why I stuck with choosing that name. So that also saves me from having to ask where the... <laughs> where the crimson key came from (laughs) yeah so it sounds like at least i i don't know if how you left the band was uh on good terms or not but it sounds like there was at least a bit of tension or could have been but there was at least some holdover because the bassist a couple of members from your previous band are helping you currently uh in your project and stuff uh, have you been able to maintain most of the relationships that you've valued over the, your course of your time as a musician? I I have. Um, there's also, it was a, a good eye-opening experience about who my real friends actually are. Um, usually when you're in a big touring band and doing a lot of things musically, you know, people, you know, flock to you and always want to stay on the up and up with what you're doing but um I, I noticed after I you know quit the band and wasn't touring and on the road as consistently as I was before there were a lot of uh, a lot of crickets in the inbox <laughs> and which is fine though because it really makes me realize who my real friends are and who were just superficial uh, industry connections so I feel very blessed to know who's who's real who's real and who's not and who I can really rely on and who is just, it was just a fleeting, you know, friendship for, you know, the sake of it being, you know, on tour or something like that. I don't know, but I, I definitely, I left the band on amicable terms and uh, there were a a lot of uh, reasons why I I had to quit. Um, The main reason was we were, you know, still coming out of a, a major pandemic being a nurse nursing was my primary focus at that time. I, I I enjoyed my job. I enjoyed what I was doing. And I felt that the the world of healthcare is still in, in chaos because of, you know, the past few years of what we've all experienced and what we've had to deal with. And I just felt in my heart that that was, that was time for me to step back from that band and really focus on my nursing career. Um, there's, of course, multiple reasons also besides that that caused me to definitely branch away. And I think ultimately it was because I I felt like there was a, a lot of controlling factors that prevented me from living my fullest life on my own terms. Um, there were a lot of things that I was able to do, but there were guilt trips with it. 
or there were things I, I wasn't able to do and there were guilt trips with it. And there was just a lot of, a lot underneath the surface that, uh, I, you know, my mom said, if I can't say anything nice, don't say it. So I'll just leave it at, there were a, a lot of things beneath the surface that I felt, um, I wasn't, my voice wasn't being heard. Gotcha. <laughs> Unfortunate circumstance for sure. It was, it was, because I, I do miss touring. I miss being on the road, but at least now I can, I can enjoy my time and really just focus on, on playing and being creative for myself and whoever else wants to listen. Awesome. You have, uh, you, you have your EP out. You, you, have realistic expectations for what's coming up next when in regards to touring and things beyond that. So what are you most excited for moving forward? I think the one thing I'm very excited about is actually um, doing some um, music videos. Um, Jeff, uh, my boyfriend, he's the bass player uh, with this project. He's a, a drone pilot. And he takes phenomenal aerial vi uh, video and views of, you know, things in, in the Florida area. And I definitely want to write some very unique tracks to fit the videos that he's able to create. So it's, it's a even more expansive collaborative project with a very talented musician and a very talented uh, photographer. So I'm working on some music to fit with some of the videos he's doing. And just so we can both release something that uh, that's, uh, we're both invested in, essentially. And um, just continue writing music. Um, definitely, like I said, continue networking out, just making new connections, still, you know, collaborating with others, working in, you know, various other projects just staying open-minded for what, you know, what the future has in store and yeah, being realistic about it and still trying to do what I can. Awesome. Oh, well, Katie, it's been very nice talking to you. Uh, uh, gen genuinely pushing up on our time here, less than a minute. Oh. Uh, <laughs> uh, tell us what you have going on. Anything you'd like to promote? How can we find you? Uh, well, uh, like I said, um, Crimson Key is on all the social media sites. Um, I haven't really switched over my Instagram to uh, Crimson Key page, but uh, I've kind of just kept myself as like the, the main page for promoting all my, my social media stuff. Um, it's on Bandcamp, uh, Spotify, iTunes, Amazon, wherever you can search out for music, it's probably going to be there. I just want to make sure that it's this EP gets out there and uh, organically. I just want the word of mouth to be able to help get this where, you know, people will listen and enjoy what I'm doing so I can stay motivated to keep keep doing more. Awesome. Well, thanks, Katie. Thank you.